and I thank uh, the organizers uh, for bringing us together, an opportunity to meet with those who are on the panel after a long time. I have been uh, sort of bugging Parminder to understand what exactly is expected from this session. Uh, and uh, I'm still trying to figure it out. And so that's, that's the limitation with which I'll share a few thoughts. Uh, I like the idea very much. Uh, and I'm so happy that this initiative is uh, happening here, especially to think of uh, people's rights in the digital world. So in a sense, abruptly, I want to uh, draw attention to some of the elements in the legal world which I think uh, will be useful for this conversation. The outstanding one in that category, in my mind, is the right to information law. I would place it, uh, you know, as a very special opportunity that uh, will facilitate the relationship between the digital world, uh, information technology, and activism. Uh, I won't go more into that just now, but it's useful to take note of the fact that it has tremendous uh, linkage with the freedom of expression and freedom of speech. In fact, before the Right to Information Act came as a statute, it was already there as a legal right by virtue of Supreme Court judgments, and that was founded on the right to freedom of speech and expression. So that is... Uh, the constitutional base from which this right to information derives. I might add that in recent legislation, I don't think there is any legislation as powerful as the right to information. And that is not only because of the content of that legislation, but it's also because of the manner in which that legislation arose. It is a hugely civil society-based legislation. And Aruna Rai's contribution to it must be recognized. Uh, in the in the parliamentary committee, the standing committee, almost 200 amendments were moved to the statute. I am one of those, uh, you know, who is sad about the way in which parliamentarians uh, uh, play a role in, in legislation. Yeah, I am sad about that. On the other hand, I am surprised and very happy that when it goes to a small committee of parliament, the level of participation, I have experienced it, is quite fascinating. And that is because you have the best of individuals from each political party sitting there, and some of them actually study what the agenda papers and come and engage quite creatively with it, and that was visible in the right to information process, and yet civil society carried, carried its voice through. Uh, let me then mention that perhaps one way of engaging in this discourse that uh, is about to happen is to look at recent legislation. Uh, and, that, and all those recent legislation uh, are marked by similar qualities as the one pertaining to right to information. So I'll just mention them, and I'm happy to note that there is an expert in the first area I'm going to mention, and that's the National, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, National Rural Employment Guarantee Act. Uh, then I would refer to the Right to Free and Compulsory an act, uh, act, and then the National Food Security Act. I think these four pieces of legislation are products of a huge involvement of civil society. And uh, that must be taken note of. And let me mention that uh, against that background is also uh, the right to life jurisprudence. I think that is closely associated with what you have put up on the agenda for discussion, especially in the context of raising uh, the idea of a certain discordance between civil and political rights and economic, social, and cultural rights. I am happy to mention that so far as human rights jurisprudence in India is concerned, it has gone far ahead of world human rights jurisprudence, global human rights jurisprudence. And thanks to the judicial activism, uh, you know, which has been stimulated through public interest litigation, India is one of those few countries where we have almost abolished the distinction between civil and political and economic, social and cultural. And that is ingrained in the right to life jurisprudence. The outstanding example of that is the Unnikrishnan judgment, which came from the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court looked at a directive principle of state policy, which is economic, social, and cultural right, and uh, said that it must be read along with uh, a fundamental right, uh, namely uh, Article 21. So what the Supreme Court did was to say that if you want uh, to have dignity for human beings, then they need education. 
and therefore what is the meaning of a right to life without dignity and hence the directive principle must be read along with the fundamental right and so uh, this huge bridging has happened and that opens itself into a whole range of rights uh, including uh, the right to food the right to housing the right to health uh, there i think you know uh, there is hardly any economic social and cultural right which cannot be covered under right to life jurisprudence and so that is an area uh, which is worth taking note of at the very outset uh, having said that uh, i think you know uh, back to freedom of expression related issues i think uh, you know one cannot forget the return of uh, national awards during this period uh, and uh, associated issues which have arisen uh, especially uh, you know in the context of what happened in bihar uh, and uh, it is in that context i think that this discourse will perhaps have uh, uh, you know a lot more uh, interesting things uh, to reflect upon uh, let me look at nrega a little more uh you are familiar with the fact that under the national rural employment guarantee act every household is entitled to have at least one person working for 100 days an important aspect a problem there relates to soil classification if you if you are inclined to use the piece rate uh and uh, combine it with the time rate that's an area where a lot of information is required uh interestingly there are uh, members of uh, of the industrial world or the capitalist world who are saying should we not now think of 150 days of employment and i think that is connected with uh, those economists who are wondering whether you know a higher level of purchasing capacity will be useful even for the sake of more sustained uh, uh, growth in the manufacturing sector uh, i'm uh, inclined to just point out that you know when the americans were going through the new deal and president uh, roosevelt was in charge of that process there was such a huge emphasis placed upon unemployment and they i think they did something which is almost parallel to the nrega and that made uh, the initial breakthrough so far as uh, you know america entering into the, the regime in which they placed themselves it's also useful to remember peace ainat in this context everybody likes a good drought uh, he points out and he refers to the major problem of uh, of nrega and uh, you know nrega also has uh, an aspect which is less known and that is you can use it for the creation of valuable assets uh, it's not just intended to be a dole and sinat points out how in some places agricultural workers and marginal farmers have worked together in order to uh, make their own lands more productive so that potential is something which i think is worth taking note of and i want to then link it uh, with the whole question of migration migration is probably the worst thing that we see in india today and migration is at a massive scale and the type of economic social and cultural right violations that happen in that context must be taken note of jean bremen is somebody who has spent a lot of time trying to understand migration is a professor from the netherlands who has spent about 40 years in gujarat uh, you know coming and going of course but he has made a huge contribution to understand migration and he calls it circulatory migration even better still you know he draws a comparison between uh, uh, primitive society if you are familiar with historical materialism in prim- in relation to primitive society we used to hear about food gatherers and hunters and jan bremen says that what we now witnessing is job hunters wage hunters migrants who are moving from one corner of india to another from eastern india to western india to southern india and that rate of migration now if you uh, look at uh, that aspect one as one program which can offer a little bit of solace is a well implemented national rural employment guarantee act that's one hope that if you can actually open up effective now if you want to do that you learn from the andhra experience and i think it's andhra pradesh government which did the best digitization in respect to monitoring nrega and uh, the uh, you know there there was an ias officer there by the name of raju 
uh, he made breakthrough in relation to implementation of NREGA. Uh, I think that is something which is worth uh, taking note of. Back to bi migration, you know, from especially the KBK districts, uh, Kalahandi, Bolangir, and Koraput, uh, you find, for example, huge migration into the brick kiln industry. And uh, the brick kiln uh, industry is a place in which uh, uh, you find the whole family migrating. And when the family comes there, the, uh, the unit of labor is treated as a family. Father, mother, and child or children are considered to be the unit of labor. And therefore, you can imagine the manner in which their economic, social, and cultural rights are violated. They are fed chicken feed, literally chicken feed. They have to live in uh, you know, incorrigible uh, settings. And uh, in that context, there are you know, human rights activists who try and pro provide a solution for children. I know a group which has raised the issue. Uh, the Orissa government denies that there is migration. So they went and caught hold of how many tickets are sold during a particular season in the railway station. And on that basis, they established the extent of migration. So you can see, you know, crude ways in which civil society has to establish uh, a certain almost well-known facts. And then they transfer, they transport a Oriya speaking teacher to Hyderabad who tries to come and teach children, you know, this is so-called education. Right to free and compulsory education. Every child is entitled to education. And here is a type of education that is given. So on the one hand, you have so many beautiful statutory rights within a human rights framework. Jurisprudentially, we've made a fantastic breakthrough. But what does it mean on the ground? I think... Uh, the extent of implementation of these rights is directly proportional to the extent to which the right holders are organized. And in that process, there can be a huge way in which uh, the sector, which is seated here, can uh, help, uh, I think, uh, in, a, in, a, in a manner in which a, a change can happen. The same thing can be uh, done, can be analyzed in relation to uh, the Right to Food Security Act for lot, lack of time. Uh, I won't go into it, but I do want to mention one thing. Post the Green Revolution, our food production increased from 55 million tons to 250 million tons. And then we claim that we are self-sufficient. The Seventh Pay Commission has recently gone back to the 15th Indian Labor Conference in order to say that the way, way in which the minimum wage under the Seventh Pay Commission should be calculated is to make sure that everybody gets 2,700 calories of food. Now, if you use 2,700 calories of food as the minimum required calorie consumption, then I don't think you can say that with 250 million tons of food grain production, you've achieved self-sufficiency. If every Indian has the capacity to buy enough food and have three meals a day, then probably you'll require 750 million tons of food to talk about self-sufficiency. So I'm just mentioning to you the different, uh, you know, context in which... Uh, uh, there is need for uh, bridging the gap. Uh, I want to make a, a reference to a personal experience of mine, and that is I contested from Bangalore North uh, on behalf of Ahmadmi Party for the MP seat. And the election commission says that the average expenditure per candidate should not be more than 70 lakhs. I wrote to all my students, and I was fascinated to see, just one email, I was fascinated to see that I was able to raise 35 lakhs. And... Uh, uh, a, a campaign which, in my opinion, was quite good, we had to spend only 25 lakhs. So we saved 10 lakhs. Whereas the ones who won the election spent not less than 250 crores. Election commission is brilliant in doing everything, except it becomes absolutely useless on the last two days before the election. They are paralyzed. Everything is paralyzed. And the traditional election missionary or the BJP or the Congress, as the case may be, they take over. And uh, so that, that's another reality. Well, I also mention this in order to say the reason why my campaign costed only 25 lakhs was at least 300 young people joined my campaign free of cost. And more than 50% of them were from the IT world. So that is something which has fascinated me. And that comes, you know, I come from a trade union background. I always believed that the minimum you need for transformation of society is to build alliances. In my days, it was worker-peasant alliance which would make the difference. During globalization, you're going through a period when the peasantry is wiped out. 
I still believe that you can't bring about change in Indian society unless you have valuable alliances built. Now, what are the new alliances that you need? There is no doubt that 300 million people of India have de derived benefits from the present development model. But don't forget that more than 800 million are marginalized. And higher the rate of growth, greater the marginalization so far as they are concerned. And in that category, I bring the Dalits, the tribals, the Muslim population, the uh, you know, uh, most uh, exploited backward classes, uh, the urban poor. So that is the, you know, the type of uh, mass of India which needs to be brought together. And there I am you know, struggling with the, what should be the role of the middle class. What should be the role of this class of people? In the past, we had the role of the revolutionary intelligentsia. But now we also know about the organic intellectual. And I think from the IT world, you, there is scope for it. I am somebody who feels very strongly that there's something unique about the IT world. And perhaps that is because everybody has an opportunity to think individually. And so there is restlessness in that community. And I think, therefore, there's a huge potential for linking up this community with the processes of change and with building a larger alliance. And I think that is the potential that lies ahead. And that's also the reason why I'm attracted to this session. And I hope to learn more during the processes of the discussion. Thank you.